26 to 5 on 2 C Canberra Live until 6 o'clock. You can call anytime you like, 6255-1206. It's a Friday afternoon and that means it's time to talk finance with Luke Smith from Envision Finance. Luke, good afternoon and I see you've brought a bodyguard once I again. have. I have. He's very dangerous. <laughs> Well, that's the best kind of body he is. to have. No, look, it's, it's, it's great to have Mark back in. Um, Mark came and spoke a couple of weeks ago about conveyancing and, and we got some really good feedback from that show. So today he's going to talk about one that's very topical for me that and is, is very specialised and that's uh, the value of a will and also what is an enduring power of attorney and, and, and why are they more than just a document for old people um, because there's some things that I, I, I get thrown at. So he'll cover off that sort of stuff. and. Mate, it's, it's just really nice to have you back in. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for the invite. Obviously, covering a very uh, important topic today. Indeed, it is. Where there's wealth, there's always a lot of relatives. Isn't well, that, isn't that what they say? I well, thought I should get that one out of the way first, and then right. we can get on with business. No, no more dad jokes this afternoon. <laughs> he's, he's up, he's quiet, and he's finished. But no, you're right. It's look, it's something that is becoming more and more important to to talk about, and I think as people accumulate wealth, we see property values go up, we see markets rally, we see people become more engaged with their finances. Controlling what you've spent the majority of your life working towards is, is very, very important. And I find it's one of the things that is overlooked more often than not, or, or the one thing that I do get every time is, hi, John, do you have a will? No, I've been meaning to do that since the kids were born. Oh, and how old are your kids? They're 40. <laughs> that's, that's the response I generally get. So, you know, having Mark to come in and, and, and sort of touch on these things, I hope it can just, you know, open people's eyes to the importance of it and, and the potential complexities of it. Um, and that's really what we want to sort of cover off today. Why it's important, what you're going to use it for and, and the impact of, of not having one. The, the other trick I find that sometimes catches people out um, is that not just that question, have you got a will? Oh, I've been meaning to do it. Um, the other one is, no, no, I've got a will. I did it before I was married. Mm. You can. There are things that happen in your life that invalidate your will, and you no longer have one that's valid. Exactly, and, you know, and that's where I think having Mark in today to talk about these key things is, is vital because some, some rookie mistakes can be made through no fault of your own, um, and, and getting some advice in this area can be, can be very, very beneficial when you look at the cost of not having it especially. So... so Yes, should we start at the very beginning <laughs> with the basics? What is a will Roll and what on. does it do? Uh, it's a very significant document, as you've just uh, covered off, but the, a will is created by someone who is alive, obviously, and then uh, comes into effect when that person dies. Um, it tries to do a number of things. Um, for example, if you have minor children, then you can nominate a guardian to look after those minor children when you, when you die. Mm -hmm. uh, it, distributes your assets, so it sort of lists who you're going to leave your assets to when you die, and you can do that a number of ways, which we'll cover off uh, a bit later on. If you're the trustee of a trust, then you can appoint someone else to be the trustee of the trust when you die, um, if you're the personal trustee. So it does do a lot um, for you. There are some rules um, around trying, uh, around controlling um, your estate after you die. So there, there is a limit to what you can do with it. Mm -hmm. You can't um, dictate terms of certain things when you die, but um, it's a very important document to have. And it's funny what you were saying before. It is a very, it is very common uh, for people to say, oh, I've been meaning to do it. I, I was the same. I was a hypocrite for a while. I was telling people to get their wills and I didn't have one. Uh, it, it's almost one of those things where you think, oh, no, she'll be right. It won't happen to me. But surprise, it does happen to everyone. Um, death, that is. So it's very wise to get one in place. Mm. Must you be so cheerful? <laughs> yeah. Happy Friday afternoon, it's, everyone. It's one of those topics. It's one of those topics. Yeah, it is. Regardless of how cheerful it is, we have to cover off. That's it. Well, let's, let's ask the obvious question. What happens if you never get around to it and you die and you don't have a will? What happens? That was something that I wasn't too familiar with until in my junior years as a lawyer. I um, had, had an experience where we had a client come in and she... Um, her husband had just died, but he just moved to Canberra. They bought a house, um, but it was in his name. He didn't have a will, he had two minor kids. She came to me and said, what do we do? Um, first of all, the process to actually gain control of the estate is, is more difficult. Um, rather than applying for probate, which is where you, a person given the authority to deal with the assets under the will, you apply for letters of administration, which is just a little bit more complicated, a little bit more um, to prove. But in terms of distribution of the estate, it didn't automatically go to the wife. So it's governed by um, the legislation in terms of what happens, and it's set out in the schedule for the act. Um, and in that situation, because there was two kids, the wife uh, got to keep $150,000 of the estate, regardless of the value, and then only one third of the remainder. Uh, the other two thirds oh, wow. of the estate had to go into um, trust for the kids. 
um, so it could be used for the law for the law. So after you spend you know 15 years building up yeah. Yeah. assets or, and, and, not, they're, they're available, and in that so circumstance it couldn't even be used by the wife for the benefit of the children it could it, it could so okay, it could have been right. used to buy a house or okay. that for the kids to use but ultimately it always had to be um, on trust for the kids yeah okay. which is makes it tricky it, it does make it tricky hence yeah. part of the importance particularly with minor kids and why people always say yeah, just our kids i'll get around to it it's mm. critical that you get around to it yeah i think that's that's a great example again of you want to be able to control assets when you're here, but also then being able to control the impact of your broader family or your immediate family um, is, is vital. I think one thing that we need to sort of separate, and I find this one as well, this has no control over your super. That's right. Let's yes. get that one out now because a lot of people make the assumption that, oh, it's okay, it's in my will. And when I sort of say to people, look, it has no control over your accumulated superannuation or pension account they're a little taken back so let's just make that distinction and get that one out there now this is for personal assets control of structures and and all of the things that you touched on before it is not for the control of superannuation or pension accounts that's done another way yeah. which we can cover off in a, in another show yeah but basically in short when you set up your super you nominate the beneficiary for the Correct. super separately from any will that you might have exactly now you do have the ability to pass money out of superannuation under that nomination to the estate yeah. and then a well-worded will can kick in and, and, and then look at the disbursement and control and all of the things that Mark touched on earlier. Now this brings us to the question I've been waiting all day to ask. <laughs> what if I don't want to leave something to my bum brother? Can I write him out of my will and will it stand up in court? Um, <laughs> interesting way to pose the question. Uh, y yes and no. Um, so any, any person that's an interested person, um, as defined, um, can make an application um, to the court for, for a family provisions application. That means they're, they, should, they have an interest in the estate, they've been left out of a will, and they feel they should um, have some of that estate. The problem with that is if anyone, it, it's a low bar to be an interested person, and anyone that makes an application, um, a family provisions application, um, can do so, and the costs of that are paid for by the estate. Yeah. So if, Ooh. Yeah, if, if Luke died, I made a family provisions application, um, Luke's estate pays for my application. Yeah. Um, there are ways to get around uh, or to make it um, harder for someone to make a claim or to, for a claim to be successful. For example, you might leave them out of your will, but you then attach a letter to that will showing your intention. So it might be that, yep, I haven't written my bum brother into the will. Um, here's why, and it's set it out very clearly. And then that goes some way to, to show the court, well, he has been considered, he hasn't yeah. simply been forgotten. Right. Uh, and there's a reason that he was left out of the will. It would it be more practical to put him in the will and say, I leave my bum brother $1 uh, and leave it at that? Or or is that just being too cheeky? No, you, you can, and that's that's been done in the past and people continue to do it, but it, 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 it's of the same effect as a letter. Yeah. It actually shows that you have thought of this person, yeah. you've chosen to leave him out or leave him a dollar. The more tricky angle on this question though is not if it's your brother, but say you've got two or three children and you have a falling out with one of them and you decide you want to cut that one out of your will. Being a direct offspring, their claim is going to be a lot stronger, isn't it? Even if you want to exclude them, they might still be able to claim it anyway. It, it is. Um, and, and it all comes down to, I guess, a lot of it comes down to how much support you've given those people. So if the kids are older, um, they're no longer drawing from you for support um, at the time that you die. Uh, and there's reasons as to why you spend the amount you put the letter attached to your will. And it is, it's, it's the same thing. It will be difficult for them, for them to make a successful application. But again, um, if you haven't done that, if you haven't considered them, um, mm -hmm. then it's likely to be successful. So the take out there is if you deliberately want to exclude somebody from the will, you need to discuss that with your lawyer and try and set it up in a way that makes your intentions as clear as possible. That's right. Yeah. And it doesn't need to be in the will, but yes, absolutely. And I think that's a, that's a screaming example of the other one that I get always is, well, I'll just do it from the post office. Oh. And I think all of the points that Mark's just made are glaring examples that you do not do that um, because having the paperwork in place the intention, the proof, the consideration, all of these things go to the quality of the document. And as Mark said, the quality of the argument that you're putting forward in relation to how your wishes will be interpreted. I think that's another one I get. I'll just do it from the post office. Yeah, those mail order will kits. Well, that, and that, when, they, when they first came out, that became um, uh, you know, a, a problem and our uh, litigation people were sort of rubbing their hands just knowing what was gonna come once mm. those mm. You know, will kits started to get contested because when, you, when you're making a will, it has to be incredibly clear. A lot of people get scared off by the length of wills sometimes, so 
even, even a, what's called a simple rule book will be nine, ten pages. Because mm. uh, your, your instructions have to be absolutely clear, otherwise it does leave room for arguments. It's like a contract almost. It's interpreted strictly by the court when probate comes, and everything has to be done. My will's very simple. Whoever wants it can have it. I'm not around anymore. <laughs> can I, can can I, I throw one up as well when we're talking about that, about being clear? Are there issues people need to consider with where assets are held? So if I hold assets in New South Wales, say I've got an investment property in Queensland, because half of Queensland's owned by people in the ACT, because everybody's got an investment property up there, it seems. Oh, Are there issues there? That not, not really. So if, if they make their will in the ACT, it's, it can still cover off on assets yeah. in Queensland. You just get a resale, uh, and then you can, you can deal with those assets in the other jurisdictions. Perfect. Okay, cool. And would that be the same for something like an enduring power of attorney? Yes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. absolutely yes. Well, that sounds like a segue, but before we get to EPOA, aren't we supposed to ask what is a testamentary trust? Because I don't know the answer. Well, uh, again, and this is this is one that I raise very often um, as, as part of that general discussion because I'm having engaged conversations with people that have spent most of their working life accumulating their assets to fund their retirement and do the things they want to do. And the comment I get often is, well, everything will end up with my kids. And I ask them, well, do you want your kids to keep what you've given them if they fall in or out of love? Um, and that's where a testamentary trust can come in as, as a vehicle to hold investment assets for the benefit of adults as well as minors, and there are uh, advantages for those. So can we maybe just touch on what it is and, and, and how it's an extension of the will and the benefits of it? Of course. So uh, people know what, a, what a, a discretionary trust is, or just a trust, so people can hold assets in a trust. Um, what a testamentary trust is, is, a, is essentially the same, but it's created under a will and comes into effect when the person that made the will dies. So if a people, uh, if I'm leaving an asset to you in a testamentary trust, if I die, that money doesn't go to you directly, it's not held in your name, mm. but it's held in a trust for your benefit. That's got a couple of advantages, uh, including potential tax advantages, so you can use that as a discretionary trust to distribute income, although yep. I understand that those sorts of advantages have been um, lower mm. values. Um, but it's also very important from an asset protection perspective. So, as an example, if um, I don't, I don't have any assets. You know, I'm, unfortunately, I'm in a, mm. an occupation that mm. seems to get sued a little bit. It sounds, um, sounds like my occupation. <laughs> <laughs> so it's best if I don't own anything. <laughs> if if someone left me an at, like a, a house, uh, that goes into my name. Uh, it's going to cost cost me money to transfer it out. So rather than that, if it's left to me in a testamentary trust, I get sued. That asset's untouchable. Mm. Um, even though it's for my benefit, I can do what I want with it. It's untouchable, it's protected. Um, so that's the other uh, good reason as to why to use a testamentary trust. They're, they're, they're simple to do, mm. they're simple to include in a will, mm. um, and the advantages that we touched on before, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and the, the, the big takeout as well, where you've started to accumulate a significant asset base, if you think about you know mum and dad being hit by a bus and all of the assets end up in the trust, if you have minor children in play, a big beneficiary or a big benefit of a testamentary trust is that minors can actually receive distributions using adult tax rates. Mm -hmm. Now that's that's important because income from any other source is taxed differently yes. to a minor. So not only is it great from a control perspective or I fall in and out of love with a partner and assets that have come in from my parents can potentially be protected as well. You can then use minor children to receive distributable income because mum and dad may inherit assets from their parents and they may not want to add to their adjusted taxable income, they can then start to use children or leave your own assets to your minor children with somebody acting as the trustee to control what happens where the kids maybe don't have the legal responsibility or the financial integrity to be able to do it. A great way to control the transfer into generationally. It's a big word on a Friday. Um, you did to, it well though. Do you like that? Um, Give yourself a pat on the back. <laughs> But that's, that, that for me is, th these things are, are, are very underutilized from an investment perspective, and it's far more than just looking at con the control, it's, it's the tax benefits and, and, and why you really need to get legal advice when you're drawing these things up. One of, one of the other things that often comes up um, when we're talking about wills is talking about what people own. So if you're talking about, um, people, people will come in and say, I own all these properties, all these shares, once you start digging down, they actually own nothing. So someone, mm. something might be in a trust, something might be held in a company with the shares in that company held by a trust. So mm. when they come in and say that, you've actually got to work out who owns what and then work out rather than passing the asset, you're passing control of the entity that owns that asset um, just to make sure that everything's going where you want to do. Mm. That's part of the investigation that we need to do. Mm. 
um, when we're actually trying to prepare the world for something. Yeah, and why again you don't go to the post office? <laughs> Indeed, and now we find out what is an enduring power of attorney, uh, attorney, and what do we do with it? So, Luke, I think said in the intro, it's not just a document for um, for older people. Um, what the enduring power of attorney does, it um, it operates when you're alive. So you make that document, you sign off an enduring power of attorney, you're appointing someone else to make decisions for you when you can't make those decisions. So that the, there's four main heads um, for a power, enduring power of attorney. It gives someone the right to make personal decisions for you, so where you live, what food you eat, financial decisions, property-based decisions, and also medical decisions. Um, there's a, there's a, lot, a lot to it. So if you don't have capacity to make the decision, if you're in hospital, you're in a coma, something's wrong, then someone with that power of attorney can make that decision for you, whether it's you know, a personal decision of where you're gonna receive palliative care or something, or um, what food you're gonna eat. I, I always sort of say, it's the sort of thing where you say, oh geez, if, if I'm in a home, I don't wanna leave South of the Lake, you know, that's the sort of thing. Where you, <laughs> um, but you can, put those, you can put those limitations on that power. Um, you can tell I'm yeah. north side. Um, <laughs> the, there's other, other more important ones, I guess, um, there's the power for your attorney to pull the plug if you're on life support. So that, that takes a lot of consideration and working out. There's also a, a donation power, whether um, some, whether you, your attorney can consent to you donating your organs. Mm -hmm. That's something right. to consider. I know some people are happy to donate, but they don't want to donate their lives. So that's a limitation you can sure. put on as well. So when you uh, draw up an enduring power of attorney, does that kick into effect immediately or does it when it kick into effect when you're declared to be incapable of making decisions for yourself? How do you work it? it? It depends on what you want. So you can do, there's a couple of options. It can come into effect immediately and then you just chuck it in a drawer and wait for it to be um, required or when you've lost capacity. Um, with, uh, traditionally, it's, well, we've, we've usually done it, it comes into effect immediately. Um, just because if a decision needed to be made and you've lost capacity, then you might need to get a couple of doctors to certify, yes, you have lost capacity, you can't make a decision, therefore the power of attorney can operate. Um, that might take time. Yeah. In an emergency situation, less of a problem. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, that's why we just traditionally do it that way, but it's up to the individual. The other thing um, in relation to the powers of attorney is that um, if you are gonna deal with assets, it will likely need to be registered. If you're talking to banks, if you're talking to land titles office, anything like that, then yes, it will need to be registered in each state where it's going to be used. Right. So it, I was just going to throw in there, whilst there are some very serious considerations there in relation to what you can and can't do, it can be used for something as simple as the home phone at my place is in my name and my wife can't ring up and give a spray to Telstra. She can send through the enduring power of attorney and say, right, I can now give you a spray because you're acting as me. So there are a number of day-to-day -day things that a lot of people don't realise as well. You could be on holiday. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a load of applications oh, yeah, that it, are, it are be, far less serious. It can be used in lots of situations, yeah. not just if you're built. It's about eight minutes to five on 2 C Canberra Live until six o'clock. Back with more in just a moment. We'll see Canberra Live until 6 o'clock and in this half hour I'm joined by Luke Smith from Envision Financial and Mark Peretti from Trinity Law. We've been talking about wills and enduring powers of eternity. What are the key points to remember to make sure we've got it all nailed down? Well, I think what I took from Mark in relation to the wills, um, don't go to the post office. <laughs> Get some advice because it's far more complicated than you realise. And when you're going to turn up, we are just talking in the ad break. If you're going to go and see somebody about that, make his or her life a lot easier and turn up with a summary of all of the assets that you have so that you can have a meaningful discussion about what you want to achieve, not what you own, because that's a byproduct of your outcome. So I think if people can keep that in mind, um, they can get the, the control that they're after. And it's one of those things that you'd want to have in place the need and not have, um, and you're never too old or too young. And remember, if you do get married, true, it null and voids will, so you need to get one done. So if you're going to get married, think about that and they can word it up appropriately. Apparently, I misspoke and said enduring powers of eternity. Um, I think that's actually a good name. <laughs> well, I don't mind it, actually. <laughs> enduring powers of attorney. Exactly. So, key things for people to take out in relation to an enduring power of attorney. Um, firstly, do it. Yep. Have always have a fallback. So, if you're appointing someone, appoint someone else as well, just in case the first person is available. Yep. And then, if you want to put any restrictions on the powers, have a think about what those are and make sure you tell whoever's doing it for you can include those restrictions. 
you know, I think that's great. And as we said before, the ad break, it's not just about catastrophic events. It can be you've gone on holiday and you need to sign for mum and dad on an investment property or take money out of a bank account. It's one of those things I always say to people, you want to have it and not need it, then need it and not have it. Um, because when you need to use these sorts of things, they're not times where you want to have discussions about control. You just want to get on with life and, and, and use them appropriately. So. You know, I thought it was really invaluable that Mark could come in today and talk about this stuff because it is overlooked regularly. Um, and I think the more we can get the, the awareness up, people can ensure that in a horrible time, potentially, they've got the controls and mechanisms in place that can get the outcomes that they're after. Beautiful stuff. So uh, where do the listeners get more information? Well, as always, 6260-4749, and uh, you can make an appointment for February. <laughs> I can say that this time of year. <laughs> Envisionfinancial.com.au. Um, we've got the Knowledge Centre. There's information on wills and injury powers of attorney. You can log in and read that. Um, to the podcast listeners, um, Spotify sent me something the other day. Several hundred followers now in uh, in eight different countries. So wow. if, you, if you told me that would have happened, you know, we're not going to shut the internet down tomorrow, but... You know, that bit, of a, good. bit of a giggle on a Friday. Um, yeah. So thank you for all the subscribers. And YouTube, Envision Financial Canberra, where we've got each week's show, uh, you can subscribe to that and uh, pause and have the key takeouts before and after the ad breaks. So there's there's a few different ways to listen to it. And Mark, if people want to reach out, where how can they get in touch? Uh, Trinity, Trinity Law, via the web, trinitylaw.com.au, or just uh, down in Barton, phone number 6163 that was too quick. Phone number what? 61 <laughs> There you go. People heard it that time. Thanks very much for coming in, both of you. Beautiful. Uh, Thank and you. Uh, Thank Luke, you. you'll be back next Friday bringing another bodyguard or doing a Yes, look, uh, next week we've got Luke McAuliffe from, uh, from Blackshaws. He's going to talk about how to make the most of selling your property and, uh, and, and leverage the, the prices that are out there at the moment. Fantastic stuff. Luke Smith from Envision Financial. And, of course, we'll have another segment of Talking Finance next Friday afternoon right here on 2CC. Two minutes to five now.